Hey everybody, so I wanted to finish our discussion about electrochemistry. So we were picking up on uh, the slide about car batteries. Uh, let's see, it's slide number 24 in the lecture notes. So as we were discussing, car batteries are wet batteries. So you have to have two different cells suspended in water. And in this case, it has to be acidic water for it to work well because lead's not very soluble um, in neutral pH or, or even an alkaline pH. So what we have is one cell on one side and the other cell on the other side, and it's separated by what is basically like a salt bridge. So it gives space so these things don't touch directly, but allows the ions to move around freely. Um, and so basically the, the, so the question I have is which, which side is being oxidized and which side is reduced, the, the lead or the, the lead dioxide, lead two oxide. Um, so we start off with zero oxidation state here, and you should pause the video at this point and see if you can assign oxidation states to everything. Um, but here's the answer. Okay, so I come up with my equation here to solve for sulfur, because uh, sulfur doesn't have any special rules, it's not a monatomic ion, and it's definitely not an element here. Um, so it's negative 2 because each oxygen has a charge of negative 2 since it's not a peroxide. And I have 4 oxygens. Then I have positive 1. I have to times it by 2 because I have 2 atoms. And then I'm adding the charge that sulfur would have, which I don't know yet. So negative 8 plus 2 plus whatever sulfur is will equal the charge on the compound, which is 0. So we have negative 6 plus sulfur equals 0, so that means sulfur is positive 6. Okay. The lead here has to be plus 2 because sulfate is minus 2. That's a minus 2, and so I'll just do the same kind of equation. It's going to end up being the same, I think, yeah, because it'll be negative 8 plus 2. So the sulfur did not change oxidation state. And then over here, we have our rules for hydrogen and oxygen. So let's see, the lead goes from zero to plus two. So from the element to BP2 plus, that is an increase in the oxidation number. So that's, a, that's a, gotta be an oxidation. Remember that if it reduces, then that's a reduction. So oxidations produce electrons. And then we gotta look here, let's see. Oh, this one doesn't change. It goes from plus 2 to plus 2, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, oh, wait a minute. Hang on. I messed up. Oh, maybe you caught this. I don't know. It's negative 2 for each oxygen, but there are two of them, so this adds up to a total of negative 4. So this is actually positive 4. So we have the lead oxide. Again, that's positive 4 becoming lead 2 plus. So we're going from plus 4 to 2 plus. That is a decrease, a reduction. So, oops, the plus sign's on the wrong side. Okay, so that's two electrons added into this lead to make it become PB2 plus. So that's interesting. So the lead can both be the thing that is being oxidized and the thing being reduced. So we have to be very careful here. The lead, the element, is the one being oxidized, so that's the reducing agent. Whereas the lead that's in the compound already, the PB4+, plus, is being reduced, and so it's the oxidizing agent. Okay, um, so that's the two cells that we have. This is our half reaction for the oxidation, and that's the reduction. Okay. Um, so when we're going in the forward direction, the battery is discharging. So you can think of it as producing energy, okay? But then in order to, for this to be useful to us, we need a battery that is reversible, meaning we need an equilibrium reaction. So if I, if I add energy myself to this somehow, either by jumping it with another car or by allowing the wheels to turn, which turns the alternator and generates electrical energy, with motion. Either way, I, I get it. If I put electricity into this, that's going to that's going to do the same thing as increasing any of these products would. So it's going to push the equilibrium back to the left. 
that's what a rechargeable battery does. All right, so we're changing the conditions so that it'll recharge, it'll regenerate your original equilibrium position. Okay, that's how that's how all re rechargeable battery batteries work. So here's another example. This is lithium ion batteries. These are what we have in our phones, our tablets, our computers, all that stuff. Um, and this is a major, major area of, of work. People are trying to make these batteries as efficient as possible so they could be smaller um, and last longer and all that kind of thing. It used to be when cell phones first came out that, well, when they first came out, they had nickel batteries, which didn't last long at all. But um, when lithium batteries came out, they weren't engineered as well as they are now, so they wouldn't last as long as they do now. Understanding how this reaction works can save us some cash, though, because batteries aren't cheap to replace, and some phones won't even let you replace them at all anymore. So the, the, the thing that's happening is we have this lithium cobalt complex, and it has a variable number of lithiums here, more than one. It's always more than one. Um, but each battery is a little different, and, and the, as the battery ages, this, this number will change. But this complex is the source of our, of our electrons. So what happens is one of the lithium leaves the complex, and when it does that, it also produces an electron. So this is the equilibrium that's happening. The forward reaction is the discharge cycle, meaning we're producing electrons. So that's what happens when you're using your phone. And the reverse reaction is the charge cycle. So if I plug it into the wall and I increase, increase the number of electrons, it's going to shove the reaction back towards the left. The cobalt is oxidized. The cobalt here is going from a plus three over here to a plus four, right? So it's losing an electron. So the electron is actually coming from the cobalt. The lithium is a plus one here and a plus one there. Uh, and this chemistry isn't all that well understood. So um, when you're discharging it, you're, re you're oxidizing the cobalt, and when you're recharging it, you're reducing the cobalt, okay? The lithium is used for both the cathode and the anode to produce the energy. It's a complicated process. We're not actually really sure exactly how the lithium does that while still being an ion. But it's interesting. Now if we think about this, since it's an equilibrium, and I said if I increase the amount of energy, it's going to shift it back to the left. But if I'm using the energy, so using my phone, it's going to shift it to the right. If I have my phone plugged in while I'm using it, this cycle is happening really, really fast, continuously, and it's going to generate a lot of extra heat. That's a problem. So you might have experienced this. If you have your phone plugged in and you're using it, it gets hot. Um, whenever a battery gets hot, it's degrading the lifetime of that battery, right? Because electrons are energy, and if I'm increasing the amount of heat, that's the same as increasing the amount of energy that's there. So that's gonna also shift the reaction left. Um, we don't really want that after a certain point, because it turns out that this complex is only stable up to a point. If you keep piling lithiums on there, it's going to start forming some byproducts, which are cobalt oxide and lithium oxide. Um, cobalt oxide is plus two. Um, this one's weird. Don't think about it too much. Lithium's only supposed to be a plus one, but this is this is actually probably a plus two. So these are not the native versions of these molecules. Um, it was you know it's plus one up here and it's plus three or plus four. So when you make these byproducts, it isn't part of the reaction here. So that means you're effectively reducing the amount of material available to participate in this reaction. Um, that results in a decrease in the available power. Okay, and this is irreversible. Once you form these byproducts, you can't get rid of them. They're not part of the equilibrium, so we can't reverse it. I've actually seen batteries where when this, this solid starts to build up, you can actually see them kind of inflate a little bit. They get kind of bulged out. Um, I've seen that in laptops where people leave it plugged in all the time. That's not good. It means that the battery can no longer hold a charge because there's not enough lithium and cobalt available to form this complex. There are ways um, that engineers, software engineers, have figured out to limit the amount of overcharging that can happen. In other words, extra electrons being shoved in even when you don't need it. So that happens when you're using it at the same time you're charging it, but it also happens when you leave it plugged in for too long. 
So there are some mechanisms built into your phone to try to reduce that, but really the only way to totally reduce it is to not leave it on the charger too long and not to use it when um, it's charging. Okay, so so far, everything we've talked about so far were spontaneous, so I'm gonna say like in the past. Everything we talked about were spontaneous reactions. We call those voltaic cells or galvanic cells, depending if you're a fan of Galva or Volta. Um, they both they both experimented with, you know, putting metals together to make batteries, basically. There's another kind of electrolytic process of electrolysis. So electrolysis is non-spontaneous. And what I mean by that is we have to put the energy in to make it happen. All right, so in the last situation, we said that the cathode was positively charged, and that's because that's where the cations were kind of collecting so they could react. In this situation, when you are putting electrical energy in to make the reaction happen, um, it's going to push the electrons onto the cathode. Reduction is still happening there. It's just a matter of which direction the electrons are going. At the anode, you still have oxidation but it's a positive charge there because the electrons are leaving that source because you're pulling them f using this voltage. So this is like a battery or plugging it into the wall. Um, so you can actually use this to your advantage. You can do some electro electrolysis at home if you want. Oh, by the way, this has nothing to do with removing hair. Okay, the words are just the same. I have no idea why. But in chemistry, when we're talking about electrolysis, we're talking about taking something where the activity series would predict the reaction won't happen and forcing it to happen by adding energy. All right, so you can make silver and gold pennies. All you do is take zinc and just zinc metal and some acid or base and you sort of heat it up with your pennies and the zinc will coat the outside of the copper penny with a layer of zinc, which looks like silver. Um, then if you take that and you heat it up, it'll form an alloy, uh, alloy <laughs> of zinc and copper, and we, we, call that bron um, we call that brass. So it'll look like gold. That's electrolysis because you have to add energy in to do that. Okay, so here's some fun facts about batteries. Um, so as a result of our discussion about how uh, changing temperature affects an equilibrium, which is a rechargeable battery like your like your car. If it's cold outside, your battery is likely to die if it was close to dying anyway. You almost never get a dead battery in the summer unless your electrical system is, is really depleted. But in the winter, it's really common to get a dead battery. In November, almost every year I have a couple of students who, who uh, send me messages saying they can't get their car to start. So one thing you can do Besides hooking up an external power source, like having somebody jump your car or having a portable jump starter, is just warm up the battery. So if you have a way of uh, taking the battery inside and warming it up, you can do that. It'll, it'll work better if it's warmer. Um, that's because it's an equilibrium reaction. You can create light bulbs using salt water and a little bit of circuitry. We learned a lot about how, how lithium ion batteries work, well, a little bit. And understanding that will prevent you from wasting your money on having to replace your phone a lot. Um, oh, this is a cool one. You can use aluminum foil and remove tarnish. Tarnish is silver sulfide. And the sulfur just comes from the air. It's around all over the place. Um, but tarnish on silverware or on necklaces comes from forming a layer of AG2S on the outside. So there's a life hack on the internet that you can see. There's videos everywhere where you just take a piece of aluminum foil and lay it down and you put some water, some salt, some vinegar in there. Um, the salt and the vinegar are basically electrolytes. Um, and what it will do is react with the silver sulfide to give you your silver back. Um, and that's pretty cool because the only other way I know of to remove tarnish is to polish it off, which means you're basically removing this instead of reacting it. So you're losing silver. So if you look at old 
silverware sets, they've lost a lot of their detail because you have to polish it off every time you want to use it. Um, if you slice apples, they get brown. The reason for that is because of this enzyme right here, polyphenol oxidase. It just turns things brown in response to oxygen contact. The way to prevent that is to add something to your apple slices that will react with air instead. So citric acid will do that. So you can squeeze some lemon juice on there or a couple drops of vinegar will do the same thing. You won't even taste it. It just prevents the oxygen from reacting with your enzyme in the fruit. Right? Um, and then of course, another important aspect of redox chemistry that we sort of spoke about in class is iron. Iron redox processes drive everything about metabolism and oxygen transport in the human body. Well, animals too. Okay, so like I said, the spontaneous cells are known as voltaic or galvanic cells, all right? Those are the ones where when we hook it all up, it generates a current. So that's what we experienced in, in lab the other day. Um, that's what makes a battery. But if I wanna say purify a metal, then what I'll do is use electrolytic cells, which means adding electricity, all right? When you're talking about voltaic or electrolytic, it's always reduction at the cathode, oxidation at the anode. So again, I remember that with red cat, okay? Um, this is a prettier picture of the same system, the same battery we've been talking about throughout this lecture, okay? So to figure out whether a battery is voltaic or electrolytic, what we'll do is we're looking for spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So if our electrical potential, our E cell, is positive. It means it's spontaneous, which means we're going to call it voltaic or galvanic. I don't care which one you use. They mean the same thing. If we have a negative E cell, that means it's not spontaneous, but if you put elect electrons into it, you could make it into an electrolytic cell. All right. So there's two ways to teach this. What I introduced in the lab is that you just take um, the reduction potential and you add the oxidation potential. In your textbook and some websites, they explain it a little bit differently. They say it's still cathode and anode in the same order, but what they say is that you should go the reduction at the cathode minus the reduction, sorry, minus the oxid, the reduction potential of your oxidation reaction. So let me explain. So when we look at the, ox the oxidation potential, so a few slides down, um, I have a few of our reference values. These ones are from the chapter and they're, they're organized by highest reduction potential. So in other words, this is, this is like our activity series. This is the most active uh, on this list, and these are the least active. And when we say that, what we're referring to is reduction potential. Okay, so in other words, all of these are written as gaining electrons. <clears throat> if we have a really active reduction potential, in other words, a very positive number, then the opposite thing would be oxidation, right? If we flip these reactions around, they become oxidations. So for example, just this reaction here with, with fluorine, if we wrote it like this, that's an oxidation reaction, okay? Um, so the ones at the top of this list, which is organized again by highest reduction potential at the top, the oxidation potential would be very low, negative, okay? Basically, it's negative 2.87, okay? So all we do to convert from a reduction potential to an oxidation potential is turn it into a negative number. Now let's say down here, uh, we have lithium. If I wanted to think about this as the oxidation reaction, I would flip the sign. You can't see it, I put it up, I wrote over it, but the sign would be 3.05 as an oxidation potential, okay? So for example, um, on this one that we've been looking at with the copper and the zinc. So we have zinc here, 
where we're saying zinc becomes Zn2 plus plus two electrons. That's the loss of electrons, so that's oxidation. So this is the one I would have to flip the sign for. This one is already a reduction, so I can just get the value right off of the appendix. Okay, so we look here. I don't know if they're going to be in this particular handout. Okay, here's copper, and we said this this was the reduction. So our reduction value for this battery is 0.34 volts, and then the zinc is right here, but it's written as a reduction. So what I'll do is turn that into the oxidation just by flipping the sign. Okay, so to figure out the cell potential, the way that I teach it is you go reduction plus oxidation. So if our reduction potential is uh, 0.34 volts plus our oxidation potential of 0.76 volts, again I got those from the table and I flipped the sign for this one because it was the reduction on the, on the table, overall we're going to produce quite a bit of voltage for this little system. Oh, whoops, it's 1.1 volts, right? So that's the total electrical potential that I have. It's positive, which means that that's a spontaneous cell. It's a voltaic cell. All right, but if on the other hand, let's just say that I tried to flip it around. I try to do the copper as the oxidation, so that would be negative 0.34, and leave the zinc as the reduction. That would mean that we're, we're going to react Zn2 plus and copper solid together. So that one, I'll just do it on a different color of pen here. So Zn2 plus plus copper solid. Um, it's going to be a negative 0.34 volts here and a negative 0 0.76 volts, okay? So we're gonna have to, so it's always cathode, which would be our zinc in this situation, plus the anode, which equals the same value, but now it's negative. That is a non-spontaneous process. In other words, if I take zinc ion and connect it with a cell of just copper, it's not going to react unless I put in this much electricity. All right. So sometimes in other videos you might see, or other textbooks, or even some places in ours, what they're going to tell you to do is if you're adding E cat plus E an, then you have to flip. The, the oxidation potential, so change that sign. If you use the equation like this, you don't change the sign, it would just be like, um, let me think, so which one did we change? So in our original voltaic cell, we changed the, the second one to be positive. So if I use this formula, it's gonna be minus the original reduction potential value so it's minus a minus, right? So you get to the same equation, all right? It's just a matter of whether you account for the negative um, in, in the equation or whether you do it in advance. I don't care which way you do it, but I highly recommend picking one method and sticking with it because if you go back and forth, you're liable to forget to flip that sign. Okay. So our Values in Appendix E and the table from the book are all based on the idea that um, the standard hydrogen electrode is our zero point. So we've assigned this reaction in exactly these conditions, also 298 Kelvin because that's the standard condition. Um, we've said that we define this exact process to have zero volts. It does not mean that no electrons are transferred. Okay, so we have to have a zero point somewhere, and all it means is that anything better at being reduced than, than this reaction will have a positive E reduction. Anything worse will have a negative E reduction. All right, um, the standard hydrogen electrode works like this. You have a glass tube with hydrogen gas in it and a platinum wire with a little platinum strip on the end. 
The tube has usually a membrane down here that allows the fluid you're testing to go in and out. Um, and the concentration of the fluid stuck inside the cell should be consistently one molar to be as accurate as possible. All right, um, so when it's acting as a cathode, the H plus gets converted into H2. So those hydrogen ions that are just in the acidic solution are gonna sit on the surface of the platinum and then form a bond and leave as H2. So that is a one electron gain per hydrogen. Um, but there's two hydrogens involved, so that's our reaction right there. The other part of it is uh, for, for oxidation to happen, the H2 precipitates onto the platinum and the platinum absorbs those electrons. Okay, so that's two electrons being taken. And then it leaves as H plus back into the solution. Okay, so this is capable of going both ways. Um, this is actually what we used in our pH meters. Almost every pH meter is like this because the platinum is very stable. It doesn't um, degrade too much over time and it's pretty easy to recharge it with some more hydrogen ion. Um, so everything listed in Appendix E is comparing the standard hydrogen electrode, um, comparing to the standard hydrogen electrode. Okay. So here's just a short little summary on how to calculate E cell. This is what we just practiced. Um, I like to turn the sign before I plug it in, but you can do it either way. I don't care. There is a source of error that's important to notice, and it probably affects our results in the lab, of course. Uh, if the solutions are not one molar, or the pressure is not one atmosphere, or the temperature, this is a big one, the temperature is not exactly 25. One molar is important too. The atmospheres don't tend to affect it a whole bunch, but it's there anyway. So I want to show you how to calculate the E cell for a hydrogen fuel cell battery. So we talked about this at the end of the thermo chapter, and you can calculate a delta H for that, a delta G, a delta S, all that stuff. But the basic reaction boils down to having um, hydrogen gas react with oxygen gas to form water. Um, the state of this depends on the temperature. So in the in the Chapter 19 notes, I actually ask you to calculate it as a gas and a liquid. Um, those are good exercises to go through. Anyway, so if we assume that it's a liquid, or rather assume that it's a gas or a liquid, you got to be consistent about which one you choose because the values will be different from the appendices. Um, so I like to look at the appendix and see what we have for um, that, would, that would have water involved. So here's one. This is liquid water. And I don't see any other, oh, here's, no, oh, that's hydrogen peroxide, never mind. Your actual Appendix E probably has more choices, but I think the only one we've got here is just H2O liquid. So we'll go ahead and use that because we have values for it. We'll assume that the temperature is at room temperature, which is what it should be, 25 Celsius. All right, so liquid. Okay, so I have to figure out oxidation states to figure out what's going on. So the hydrogen is plus one and the oxygen is minus two. The elements are both zero. So what we have here is something going from H2 and increasing the oxidation state. We have two hydrogen ions there for H2 to go to H plus. Um, if I'm going from a zero to plus one, that's an increase, and I've increased two different atoms by one, so that's two electrons that we have lost. The oxygen, on the other hand, is going from zero to minus two, so that's our reduction. So here's our oxidation, here's our reduction. And again, I look at that because zero to minus two, the number goes down, that's reduced. All right, um, so, I don't know. You have to add the electrons, right? So I have, this is interesting, because I have, I'm going from zero to a minus two, so I have to transfer two electrons per oxygen, but I have two oxygens, right? So 
I'm actually transferring 4 here, which is why we actually need to have 2H2, and we're producing 4 of them. All right, so I have to multiply both of them so that the charges will cancel. Okay, so essentially this is our overall process. And so we look at the appendix or at the table in the book and we try to figure out one that might help us. So here's a potential one. However, we don't have hydroxide in our half reaction, so I don't think that's it. Um, here's another one with hydroxide in it. So I pulled up the appendix here so I could get all of the possible electrical potentials that we have available. And I like this one also because it's listed by elements, so all the oxygens are in one place. So I can kind of look at them and be like, okay, well, I don't think it's this one because it makes hydroxide. That one makes hydrogen peroxide, which I know is quite reactive. This one has ozone in it, so I don't think it's that one. So I think the best bet is this reaction, which has water as a product, which is what we have. Um, it does have some H plus in there, so that's a little, that isn't part of our reaction, and I think sometimes people hesitate to use it as a result of that. So what we're going to do is, is realize that this isn't actually what we are doing, okay? Um, what we're really going to do, let me go back to the appendix, is actually this reaction, O2 plus 4H plus. And it's going to form, oh, plus my four electrons. And it's going to form two water. And the reason we choose that is because we have a potential for that. We know that that's a possible reaction. So And then I look on here to try and find a reduction, or no, I'm sorry, the oxidation. So I'm looking for the backwards reaction, right? Um, I'm looking for the one where it'd be like four electrons plus four hydrogens gives us two H2s. So I kind of just look around where the hydrogens are. Here it is, F for iron and then H. So this is the backwards of that reaction, and this one's also doubled because I need four electrons for this process to happen. So um, normally we will just flip the sign in order to account for the fact that we, we said that's the oxidation. In the case of zero, there is no sign, so I don't have to worry about it. But if this was a number, I would just turn it into the negative value. And then um, I want to tell you that even though we, we've doubled the reaction, the voltage doesn't change, okay? So because voltage is, is kind of like a force, it's how much, um, force you can exert with electrons. Uh, doubling the amount of material does not double the force. Okay, It just stays the same. So we flip the sign when we reverse the reaction, but other than that we don't change anything. So our cell potential, it's E cat minus, uh, plus E n, or you can think of it as the reduction plus the oxidation if you flip the sign, which we did, because it's negative here. So you get 1.23 volts from that, which is, it's more than our copper zinc system, but I would say probably less than our lead systems from the car batteries, okay? So if E cell can tell us spontaneity, right? We said that, um, you know, let's just make a list of things. These are spontaneous. If you have a positive E cell, that's spontaneous. Um, take a second, pause the video, and list as many things that, that are spontaneous as you can think of with their sign. Okay, so I have a negative delta G is spontaneous, a negative delta H is spontaneous, a positive S is spontaneous. Um, that's what I can remember. Maybe there's more, but those are the main criteria. Um, if these things are all true, then there must be relationships among these things. So we know that Gibbs equation, that's this one, 
Gibbs free energy equation predicts the it sort of tells you the relationship between enthalpy, entropy, uh, and temperature. So we know that those things are all related to each other. So there must be a connection with our E cell as well because that's determining spontaneity. Okay, I cleaned up the slide a little bit. There we go. I cleaned up the slide a little bit to get rid of the writing so I could see it, but it's important to understand all of those things are indicators of spontaneity. But that means there's connections between them. Okay, so this this one graphic from chapter 20 is probably the most important picture in all of the chemistry courses because it connects everything we've learned all semester. So not only is, it, is E cell connected to delta G, that's this equation, but it's also connected to equilibrium right here. All right, and so it's, it's a giant circle. You can go around. If I have one value, I can find any other value that I need with just a small amount of information. So here I wanted to find some variables. This one is Gibbs free energy, right? That's negative when it's spontaneous. N is moles of electrons. So part of the reason we spend so much time writing reactions, half reactions, is because we need to know how many electrons are being transferred in order to use the electrical potential, E cell, to find a delta G. So here, our moles of electrons are four. So that number, that N, comes from the balanced reaction. Actually, from the half reactions. They have to be balanced. So there's four electrons being transferred. F is a constant. It's called Faraday's constant. It, it's the number of charge units, which is called Coulomb, after the guy who kind of discovered it, uh, in a mole of electrons. Okay, so this is a constant. It's 96,485 Coulomb per mole. Um, so anyway, you get, if you've written your, written your half reactions, you know what to put here. This is a constant, and then this is what you calculate from Appendix E. So you can use those things together to find a delta G. All right. So if this is a positive number, that's always a positive number, and that's always a positive number. This negative will mean your delta G is negative. So that's why a positive E cell is spontaneous, while a negative delta G is spontaneous. Okay, so let's connect E cell to equilibrium. Okay, so this formula, this, this R is the one that has joules in it. That, of course, is in Kelvin. This is the same constant as above, so that's that 96,485, and the N is still moles of electrons, okay? So in the prior example, I would put a four here. The rest of it is just constants, all right? I can calculate a K value for a rechargeable battery based on how much voltage it produces. This is very fast to measure. You guys were able to measure three voltages in a very short period of time in lab. Whereas to tell an equilibrium value, we'd have to measure the concentrations, make sure that they're not changing, and then you can calculate it. Um, so you can, I, you can see the connection here. It's a lot faster to measure a voltage than it is to, to, to figure out concentration of everything in your solution. Okay, but if I knew a K, like say, for example, the KAs in the appendix, I can also calculate an electrical potential of that. So if you've ever seen things like the potato clock or people make little lights out of lemons, this is why it's those acids in there that are doing that, okay? Um, and then uh, what, this is a review equ equation. Once we have a K value, you can use it to calculate delta G. So if this is positive, the overall answer to this term will be negative, so delta G is negative. If this is positive, then E is positive. So that's all spontaneous, okay? So each one of these reaction, equations rather, uh, are interrelated, and if you have one of them, you can get the rest of them. Okay, so far we've been assuming standard conditions, right? So actually, each one of these is written with our little standard bubble on it. Um, the Nernst equation is the way that we relate those the value of a practical situation like where it's not 25 or the conditions aren't one molar um, 
So when we have non-standard conditions, we use the Nernst equation, um, which is similar to Gibbs free energy when we rearranged it to account for different temperatures. Okay, so the Nernst equation is derived from a series of uh, calculations that you can find on page 872 of your textbook. Um, but essentially, it boils down to one of two ways to present it. It's either the electrical potential under non-standard conditions is the potential under standard conditions minus some constants. Right, so R, T, and F are the same constants we just saw. N is moles of electrons, and you can use log Q here. Um, or, same equation, it's just a matter of which button you push on your calculator. Right, so our Qs here are still products over reactants, just like they always have been. Um, not forgetting to use the coefficients as exponents and all of those things we learned in the equilibrium chapter. Uh, but the difference between this and a K is it might not be at equilibrium. So we can use concentrations of things at any point in a reaction to figure out what the electrical potential is. So the difference between these two equations is this is the log base 10 and this is the log with natural number. The factor here is how we go between those two things. Um, it doesn't matter which one you use as long as you're using the right button on your calculator. Okay, But both of these equations will do the same thing. You'll calculate this value from the appendix. R is just our constant, 8.314 joules per mole. This will be whatever temperature you've done it at. This is 96,485 um, basic joules per mole. And this is number of electrons being transferred. So that's the moles of electrons from your balanced reaction. And then you would find this by measuring it. Okay, That'll allow you to cal calculate the electrical potential of that reaction under those specific conditions. Okay, so this video from Khan Academy is a fantastic explanation of the difference between an electrolytic cell and a voltaic cell. So I'm going to link it in Blackboard and I highly recommend you check it out. This is called electroplating, okay, in a normal language. So when you're doing an electrolysis reaction, you're adding electrons in and that causes the metal on the cathode to expand, to get bigger, all right? So the last thing I want to talk about is how to quantify how big you can make your cathode, essentially, in an electrolytic process. So this figure from your book summarizes all the different conversions that we can do. So here's an example. If I know, I want to know how many grams of aluminum there are, so I'm trying to get grams of substance that was oxidized or reduced. Um, I'm doing electrolysis of AlCl3, so that means I'm taking ion um, and I'm going to produce aluminum by adding three electrons to it. So I'm ignoring the chlorine because, well, chlorine. I just know that chlorine doesn't do anything. It's just a counter ion so that the aluminum ion will go in solution. So Al3 plus, I add electrons, so that's gaining electrons, which means that's a reduction. Okay, so these electrons are going to come from the wall. I'm plugging it in. Okay, so we, we have a current of 10 amps. So, as it turns out, I can figure out the word amp actually means coulomb per second. So if I have 10 amps, that means I'm, I've got 10 coulomb per second. So if I multiply by the number of seconds that have happened, I can cancel that. So I've got one hour. That's 60 minutes in one hour and 60 seconds per minute. So I get to cancel minutes and I cancel hours. So I have performed this reaction for 3,600 seconds and each second added uh, 10 coulomb. So this is just your basic dimensional analysis and we're going to get 36,000 coulomb of charge um, 
So that gets us to this point. From there, I can use Faraday's constant because that has um, a relationship between moles and coulomb. So his constant is 96,485 coulomb per mole. So I can't use it like this because the coulombs are not going to cancel, right? So what we'll do is flip it. A lot of people make that mistake, so I just wanted to show it to you so you, you're on the lookout for it, right? So I want to put moles on top because that's what I'm trying to get to. And F, Faraday's constant. So it's like the inverse of Faraday's constant. It's one mole uh, of, of electrons for that many Coulomb. All right, so as usual, our number of moles should be a relatively small number. It was only an hour after all. So we have 300, uh, 0.373 moles. And to be specific, these are moles of electrons, okay? This will allow us to use this reaction where we've said we know how many moles this is. We can figure out how much aluminum that will be using your normal balanced reaction, right? So um, one aluminum requires three electrons. So all together, I have produced that many moles of aluminum. So that gets us to here. And the last step is to just multiply by the formula weight and that'll get us grams. So the formula weight of aluminum is 26.98. Uh-oh, where did my mouse go? There it is. So, altogether, we produced about 3.36 grams of material. So it's really just dimensional analysis. The trick is that people see amps and they don't know that it's coulombs per second. Okay, so once you get to that point, it's it's relatively straightforward. And then this, I would say these two facts right here are the most important part. Realizing that Faraday's constant can be used as a as a conversion factor and reusing, realizing that amps is really coulomb per second. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. I hope this helps. If you have any questions as you're working on your um, studying for your exam, please feel free to reach out.